I'm going to be a huge dork. I'm just going to prep you for that now. Um, I'm also going to say that originally the warnings for this talk included images. And then you'll see later why I decided not to include them, because there's a whole point that it goes to. But um, what sort of prompted this talk was a conversation between Ash and I on Twitter and a couple other people on Twitter. And oh yeah, by the way, you're in a tweet, you're going to whatever, that's all fine. I don't care. Like, go nuts. <laughs> go on. Go on with your bad tech selves now. Uh, I told you I was a dork. Um, but one of the things that comes up a lot when we're talking about surveillance now, everyone's sort of freaking out because NSA and all of these things, and there was a lot of shock about the lack of response from certain communities of color um, because, well, I grew up here. I, I grew up around former Panthers and former civil rights folks, so I don't really understand a world without surveillance. I know that somewhere out there someone gets to live in that world, it's just not one I've ever been to. Also, I was in the US Army, like, come on. So we've got official surveillance and we've got unofficial surveillance. Official is, you know, going to be the NSA, the FBI, um, your local law enforcement, you know, the body cameras, that kind of thing. But unofficial surveillance, you know, cell phones, I sort of left off the, the ways in which people are observed by security cameras and businesses that you may not even be aware of, right? If you walk around Walmart, and you look up and you see that little black bubble, right, somewhere in the ceiling, those are cameras. In some places that you go in your day, you're walking past a camera every couple of feet. So one of the things that comes up a lot to be sort of pro-surveillance is those cameras are there to protect you. They're there to prevent crime. They're there to help people. Yeah, sort of. They're there to stop shoplifting in theory. I'm not actually sure they're super effective for shoplifting. I've seen some mixed data on that front. Um, and then when you start to get into how people interpret what they see in terms of the footage, right? Because the defense for surveillance is always, if you don't have anything to hide, what difference does it make to you? There's this little thing called COINTELPRO, right? Um, and what the FBI lied and told people and the ways in which they tried to convince Martin Luther King to kill himself, the ways in which they tried to make sure people turned against Malcolm X. There's, there's all those little fine point details. So surveillance is already something I'm not inclined to trust. But then we get into now that it's all happening online, right? I forgot to change slides. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> in terms of who's targeted for surveillance, it's usually based on race. It's usually based on sometimes religion. Um, more and more it's about you know being um, Muslim um, or not white, Christian, male, really. Uh, but the disability, your level of privilege, all of these things come, become factors in who people think is supposed to be under surveillance, right? So when the body cameras went on cops, everyone said, see, that'll stop police brutality. Surprise! There's all these great studies that show that all those cameras taught us was that cops are ruder to black people. That's, that's what they figured out. Didn't change anything else, right? Um, unofficial surveillance then comes into play because we have the Walter Scott case where we have a guy who sticks his cell phone up over a fence and records a cop shooting a man in the back and then planting evidence on it. And you would think that this would be the case where no one would argue. There's no way to argue. The reason I decided not to show you clips is because when I went to look for clips, I made the mistake of looking at comments on those clips. You didn't need to see that. I need those people to turn their locations on, but that's a separate conversation. Um, but one of the things that came up was they still decided, even in the face of video evidence, remember we're back to the idea that surveillance protects you. In the face of video evidence, they still said he must have deserved it. Why did he run? What could have scared him? It never occurs to them to ask, what did the cops say? What scared him, right? They don't see it. They assume he's got no reason to run because the cops said. But we just figured out that the cop lied to you about what happened. We know the cop lied because the cop said he stole his, his weapon and that the cop had to shoot him to protect himself. But we have on video, he steals no weapon, he's running away, he's shot in the back, and the cop chases him to kill him. We see this play out over and over again where Tamir writes. The police officer tells you that Tamir is pointing the gun at people, that he's scaring people. Actually, Tamir has 2.4 seconds to react, I count it. Don't watch that video. 
he doesn't have time to point anything, he doesn't have time to put anything down. What you actually see on that video is the cops pull a drive-by. Before this kid has a chance to react, the cop has pulled up, is out and killing him, and then tells you he, did, he didn't respond, he put, didn't put down the weapon. But the video evidence is there. Go look up the outcome of the Tamir Rice case. I, I'm, I'm going to let that be a real surprise for you. It's not really. Um, you know, we have surveillance in schools, same thing. Cops in schools, surveillance in schools. It's to protect you. I watched a 13-year-old boy be picked up by his neck by a behavioral specialist. He wasn't violent, he wasn't fighting anyone, he was autistic, and he walked out of his classroom. And even then, even as you watch an adult man choke a child and drag them to a room, people found justifications, right? We saw the little girls in a host of states. Listen, I had a list, and somewhere in the middle of that list I got sad because it happens in North Carolina, it happens in Maryland, it happens in Detroit, it happens in a lot of places. We're school resource officers, school cops. I grew up in a school with a cop not one that was quite that brave, um, snatch little girls up and body slam them. And here's an interesting and fun fact for you in terms of surveillance. People look at that and they say, oh, those must be bad kids. I went to school with actual bad kids. I went to school with kids that carry guns. I went to school with kids that were in gangs. Guess what never happens in those buildings? Surveillance, no surveillance. You don't hit kids who are actually a danger. You don't target communities that are actually dangerous. That's why you have all those lovely pictures from that ranch out west where they're pointing guns at cops and nothing happens to them. But John Crawford stands still in a store that sells guns, holding something purchased in the store, and is killed. And then later, after they watch the video, they figure out. So when we're talking about tech and surveillance as a way to protect you, who is it protecting? What is it protecting you from? Right? Now I'm going to get real ugly because I described all those things to you. It's really just postcards, Jim Crow postcards for the future. Something that you maybe didn't know about was that lynching photographs used to be passed around. People used to trade them like playing cards, right? You could buy your copy of someone's death and glory in it. Well now, you don't have to go out and buy it. It doesn't have to be sent to you by a specific person. You turn on the internet. Autoplay is a monster, right? So. You're desensitized now. Those people must have deserved it because they're on this video dying. Those people must deserve it because they're on this video being beaten. A 14-year-old girl is snatched out of a pool in Texas and beaten up by a strange man who may or may not be a police officer. And people say, well, she must have done something to deserve it. She must have mouthed off. Who's that surveillance protecting? He's wearing a camera so you can see when you go back and watch the footage later. Other people have cameras. No one's in danger. These are kids playing in a pool. Right? But meanwhile, those, those things have become snuff films for bigots. They become trophies. People trade them. People pass them around. We've seen all of these deaths, right? We've seen John Crawford, Walter Scott, Eric Garner, Tamir, James Boyd. What else do you need to see? When the Daniel Holt Squad case happens, people said, well, there's no video footage. There's DNA in his pants. So the surveillance on his car is what proves it to the police, right? That's where surveillance ends up protecting someone after the fact, kind of. But otherwise, you can watch all of these people die. You can watch all of these people be beaten. And I didn't list women's names, um, because if I start talking about Rakia Boyd and other people, I might start crying. But you can see all of these deaths anytime. There's a woman who jumped in front of a car to save a kid. I've seen footage of her getting hit more than I've seen any concern for her well-being. There was a woman here in Chicago, a security guard, who was punched in the face by a drunk guy. This is the closest we get to surveillance kind of protecting someone pretty much because by the end, there was no way for him out to get out from under it. Facebook's facial recognition software kind of sees to it he can't get away with it. But that's all the surveillance people are okay with. They're all okay with something happening after the fact. They're all okay with the idea that the NSA is watching you for your own good, for their own good, for all of that. We get cops in schools, North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas, all of these places are justifying the behavior of those cops. We've got the school to prison pipeline playing out, not just in those places, but some of the most egregious examples can be found there, where again, it's about those kids don't have a right to privacy. You don't have a right to privacy anywhere you go. Basically at this point, by the way, if you've picked up an Alexa or whatever the other home assistance device is, 
you're in your 1984 future, right? Meanwhile, <laughs> get to the identity politics of this. I am a black, disabled vet with PTSD. I'm a mom, I'm a bunch of other things, right? If the cops stop me, if I get into it with the cops, the assumption is probably gonna be that somehow I did something to deserve it because this is the skin I'm in. Meanwhile, Harvard. Some of you may have heard this story, many of you may have not. Harvard rescinded admission for 10 people, right? They rescinded their admission because those kids were smart enough to use an official Harvard group to plan a second offensive meme group, meme group, in which they made jokes about sexual assault, about raping children. Um, they had a meme about what do you call a black child that's been hung, no, I'm sorry, a Mexican child that's been hung, a pinata, right? They did all of this, they attached their names to it on Facebook, and then Harvard, because they named the group Harvard memes for the blah, 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 bourgeoisie, I don't remember the whole name. Um, you, don't, you don't care. Harvard gets wind of it. It's funny what happens when you use an official group to play an unofficial group and require posting nasty things to the official group to be part of your process to get into the unofficial group. It's amazing. And now they say it's not fair. They didn't know anyone was watching. They didn't know anyone was paying attention. What do you mean they can just yank my admission? What I mean is that they can just yank your admission because surveillance is that bed that privilege made for other people to lie in. But we're all in this bed together, right? Humans aren't really altruistic, so I'm taking the slant of thinking about what it means when you say watch those people. What happens when they start watching you? What happens when you don't meet the standard? Because hiring decisions, how many people in this room when they're hiring sometimes do a quick Google of a candidate's name, just to make sure. Yeah, how many people, if you see the wrong thing, you manage your risk, because that's all Harvard did. Harvard looked at, well, you're making these jokes, and maybe you've got this history in your record from high school or wherever, some other red flags when we look at you. I don't feel like running into this lawsuit, because here's where surveillance kicks in. It doesn't just work one way. It doesn't just focus externally on groups that are not you. Sooner or later, it comes home to roost for everybody. Now, if you want the future where we're all under surveillance all of the time, I guess, but you should think about why you think it's okay for people who are disabled, people who are of a different race, people who are of a different religion, to be targets of near constant surveillance when they're not the threat, right? Because all those mass shootings, people say, how come the police didn't know? The police weren't watching white guys. The police weren't specifically watching white guys who own weapons and who have had um, domestic violence issues in the past. But guess what the metric is for most likely to, right? So again, who's being protected from what? What are you safe from? Then you run into things like writing your social media policy for your company. And you find out that you've got someone on the hook who's got a history of sexual harassment online, got a history of making these kinds of memes, being in these kinds of groups. And you say to yourself, you know, I'm not sure. I want this person to be the face of my company. And they say, that's not fair. Your question then has to become, well, what happens to my other employees? Because this guy who thinks rape jokes are funny, this person who thinks racist jokes are funny, the EEOC applies to everyone, including startups. How do you explain later, because you have a social media policy, or you should, and if you don't, I'm surprised, that you let this person in the door, and this is what happened. So these are all worst case scenarios now ahead where you, you've let the Alexa in, you've agreed to all the surveillance, and now, unfortunately, no matter what you do, under Cheeto McGee, that's his name, Cheeto McTiny Cross, I have a, hundred, a dozen names. You can't even say something rude about him on Twitter without losing your job. You can't say anything rude about your boss without losing your job. You can't. Talk back when an officer tells you to do something that's wrong. You can't do any of these things because surveillance rules say that unless your behavior is perfect, you deserve whatever happens next, right? Um, so possible solutions. Because I know, I get it, it's a balancing act, right? Like we all know that in theory, you are supposed to want to have some level of protection, some level of watching what's going on around you, blah, blah, blah. But how do you balance that with a narrative where only some people are supposed to be being watched, only some people are supposed to be at risk? You have a couple of options. You can either agree to all be watched, that doesn't sound like the best plan, 
or you can start thinking about risk factors. You can start thinking about what, what, what actually constitutes a risk, a risk factor. It's not going to be for the record. Well, she was black and female and she was mean to me on the internet. I will be mean to you on the internet if you make me. It's, it's gonna happen. Um, Harvard actually applied, bizarrely, a pretty good metric, right? They said, hmm, you named your group after us. You made participation in your group contingent on doing something in our official group. Then you said these things with your real name attached. Then we conducted an investigation. We made sure that you said these words. Maybe behind the scenes, we took another look at your application. Maybe we looked at your discipline record from high school. They didn't have to make any of that public. Maybe they looked at how many private schools you got kicked out of. Questions, questions. Um, but then at the end of that, we did our, 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 our risk checking and we decided that this group, this small group of 10, there's no way you meet our criteria for admission. And all along, we reserve the right. We told you up front, before you joined the Facebook group, before you applied, before you did all of these things, that we reserve the right to deny you enrollment based on your behavior. At some point, as a company policy, right, we're seeing this happen now, and I'm gonna say it, with Uber. Uber went out and hired all the worst people they could find, apparently. I, I don't know. <laughs> life choices, life choices. I've never seen anything like this, right? So we've seen these write-ups where like, you sent in writing with your real name attached sexual harassment to someone. You sent in writing your racism, your bigotry, your whatever, with your real name attached through official work channels. I know startup culture tells you that these things are just, you know, not gonna apply to you, but then the lawsuits happen. There's this concept called hostile workplace. And here's a great way for you to avoid it, right? Because many of these companies that will say they don't believe in surveillance and whatever, you're still keeping track of what your employees say, right? So maybe you start to look at your risk factors beforehand. Maybe you make this a conditional thing. Not so much, well, you can't say anything negative about the president, but wild idea, wild idea. You can't threaten people. You can't harass people. You can't make comments about their gender, their race, their sexual orientation, their religion, all of these things in a negative way. If you may think them, you don't have to say them at work. You certainly don't have to say them to the people you work with. You really, really don't have to use them to make hiring decisions, to make any decision. But if you are, well, now that surveillance culture that you were kind of thinking about, maybe the NSA is bad, maybe this is bad. Well, you know what's really bad? It's really bad when your problems are not so much Russian spies, although you know we have a whole thing happening here with that in America. Um, but your problem is that you've created an office culture that guarantees you four or five dozen class action lawsuits, right? Uber's gonna end up chopped up and sold off at an auction block at this rate unless they get their lives together. My money is not on Uber, just saying. So you have to look at that. You have to look at mitigating your risk, I get that. But you also have to look at how you're mitigating your risk and what standards you're setting. Because if you're just going, Googling and saying, so-and-so had an opinion online that I didn't agree with, so I'm not gonna hire them. Well, you're part of the problem. So-and-so had a, an interaction that I didn't like. So, right? What are you looking for? What are you looking at? Also, really, honestly, think about why it's so important to you to see what people are doing off the clock, what they're doing in private, what they're doing wherever, if it's not dangerous, if it's not something that applies in your life and, or to your company culture. So, you know, I'm a big fan, wild concept, I know, of thinking about what happens when everyone's being watched. What does it mean that you're comfortable with other people being watched when you're not being watched? But you're very uncomfortable with the prospect that maybe that camera's gonna turn to you. That's my talk. Questions? <laughs>